We've been studying through the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, and tonight we've come to chapter 16. Now, as we've been going through these, these different uh, chapters, there's some that stand out as being uh, kind of pivotal chapters. As we had said, uh, we, and I repeat this almost every time, that Matthew, he, he, he grouped his stuff thematically. So things aren't necessarily chronological in Matthew's gospel. But we can see there were points or we could see turning points in the mystery, ministry of Jesus Christ. Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6, and 7, was Jesus Christ laying down the kingdom manifesto. Because remember, we said that Matthew's gospel is about the kingdom. He presents Jesus as the Messiah, the King of Israel. In uh, Matthew chapter 11, we saw how there was a, there was a change uh, from uh, going to the lost sheep of Israel to the Gentiles. That's where Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor heavy laden, I will give you rest. We saw in chapter 13 the parables of the kingdom, where Jesus was telling the parables of the way the kingdom of God would be on this earth until he returned. You see, his followers, from the very beginning, they believed that Jesus would be the Messiah, would be the king, and they fully expected him to uh, express his, his kingdom, establish his kingdom on the earth. And one thing that troubled his followers was he wasn't doing it quite the way they thought he should. And of course, it's really the reason why they all ran and hid when he was taken and crucified, because they were shocked, even though he tried to explain to them that you know, he would have to suffer and so forth. They just really stopped their ears. But we see in these, in these places, these, these transitional chapters, chapter 13, the, the, uh, the gospel of the kingdom and so forth. We come to chapter 16. And chapter 16 is one of those turning point chapters, one of those turning point places in the ministry of Jesus and in the narrative in Matthew. And it begins like this. If you remember uh, last week in chapter 15, the, Jesus was coming under more and more intense opposition and scrutiny from the Pharisees and the scribes. Uh, they, they challenged his, uh, the fact that he wasn't going through the ritual washing of his hands every time he would sit down to eat and so forth. And he was getting more and more, he was getting bombarded more and more with, with questions and challenges from the powers that be, because they recognized, they recognized who Jesus was too. They recognized that he was presenting himself as a Messiah, and they didn't want him. They didn't want him because he was going to demote him. <laughs> they weren't, they weren't on his, uh, on, they weren't going to be in his cabinet, as it were. So anyway, in chapter 16, it says this. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Now, up until this point, this is really entering into like the last year of his ministry. And he had been doing tremendous miracles and tremendous things. He'd been raising people from the dead and healing people and all these things. Yet they, they, they said they wanted to see a sign. The fact is that they would not have believed any sign because they didn't want to believe him. They were challenging him. They were trying to make him do something that they could, they could grab a hold of and, and, and accuse him of something illegal. They remember when he healed people on the Sabbath, they accused him of being a Sabbath breaker, even though the rules that they set up weren't the rules that God set up and so forth. So they were looking for ways to attack Jesus. And he answered and said unto them in verse 2, <laughs> When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning... It will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you can, uh, but can you, uh, you not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Now, we can read this a similar accounts here in other Gospels. They came and they wanted a sign, and he said, you know, if you're not going to accept me for what I've taught and what I've done already, you're not going to accept me for anything. He said, an evil and adulterous generation, they're looking for a sideshow. They're looking for a show of power. 
Just like today. There's a lot of folks that under the guise of religion, they're looking for something that's going to entertain them, that's going to attract them, that's going to amaze them, that they're, you know, that's going to be just so uh, amazing to them. And the thing is, even if they see something like that, they might, they might, they might believe for a little bit, but when it wears off, they'll just be looking for a bigger, a bigger party, you know. And that's what they were doing. It's all part of this transition. We're seeing the difference between religion and relationship, between true faith and hypocrisy. He said, you know, you can tell what the weather's going to be like. I mean, they probably have, did about as good a job as what they do today, you know. He says, you can tell what the weather's going to be like, but you can't, you can't tell what's going on right now. Can people see what's going on in the world right now? I mean, are, are people blinded? It's just, it's just amazing to me, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not even, I mean, some of you might have seen that, that, that girl down at CMU. They, they, had, they, had, a, they had a little they had a Mardi Gras parade or something. You see that? She dressed up like the Pope. Didn't have any clothes on. She didn't have any clothes on. Well, if I was a kid, you know, when we were kids, if we walked out without any clothes on, they'd arrest us. And probably put us, 302 us up in the psych ward. And here's the amazing thing. I don't know how many of you saw that on the news, but they, they, were, they were talking to some of, the, some of the students there, and they said, well, what do you think of this? And these students were like, well, <laughs> well, you know, it's art. Not the art. Can't people see how crazy the world has gotten? Shouldn't, that shouldn't make, when people see stuff like that going on, they should run because it's just like it was back in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the way it is. It's like Sodom and Gomorrah. People have no modesty. They have no, they, they, you know, when, when sin abounds, the love of many will wax cold. People, you know, uh, I, I think of the demoniac when they said, uh, when Jesus healed him, they said he was clothed and in his right mind. And there's people that's out of their minds. They're running, out, running around without clothes on. He left them and departed. He said, the only sign that you're going to get is, go read Jonah. Know the story of Jonah. He was three days and nights in the belly of the fish. And some people say that he died there, and some people say he didn't. I believe that he died in it because that was, that was a sign of Christ. He, he, was, he died for our sins, was buried and raised again. Jonah went in the belly of that fish, and after three days got vomited out, and ended up going to where God told him to go. Jesus says, that's the only sign you're going to get. You can take that or leave it. And the fact is, they, wouldn't, they didn't even believe that, okay? Even when he was resurrected, when they went and found the empty tomb, they paid the soldiers and said, hey, hey, listen, just tell them you fell asleep. And somebody came, and his followers came along and took the body. Even then they wouldn't believe. When, when the disciples started doing miracles after Christ was resurrected, even then they wouldn't believe. They're not, some folks ain't going to believe no matter what you do. You can make a car fly, they're not going to believe. It says in verse 5, And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. If you read the same account in Mark, Mark says, uh, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. And it's, it's probably that Jesus said all three things, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Herod, because we said that Matthew kind of compressed some things. Now, when they reasoned, them, when they heard him say that, they said, he's mad because we, f- we forgot to bring lunch, <laughs> you know. We forgot to bring bread. And when Jesus perceived that, he says, O you of little faith, why reason you among yourselves because you have brought no bread? He says, look, I just got done feeding 4,000 people with a couple loaves and fishes, and you're worried about bread? That's what he says. He says, and before that, I fed 5,000 of them with a couple loaves and fishes, and you think I'm mad because you didn't bring bread? He says in verse 11, How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? 
Then understood they how he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And again, Mark adds Herod. Watch out for the doctrine of the hypocrites. When you talk about Pharisees and Sadducees and Herod, you talk about leaven. Remember Jesus told the parable about the woman that hid the leaven in three measures of meal? It doesn't take much. For those of you that bake, you know, you put, if you put too much leaven in, what happens? It, they put just enough in and it makes the bread puffy and soft. And Jesus says it just takes, or Paul said, it just takes a little bit of leaven to leaven the whole thing. And throughout the scriptures, never is leaven anything but evil, representative of evil. It always represents evil. The groups of people he's talking about here and over in Mark, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and, and Herod, the Pharisees were the fundamentalists. They were the fundies. They were the, the strict adhering to the law of Moses. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. They tried to follow every jot and tittle of the law. They believed the Old Testament. They had faith. They believed in the supernatural. They were the fundies. They were, so, they were so intent on, on doing everything just perfectly that they didn't understand the nature of the law. They, didn't, they weren't living by faith. They were living by trying to obey the law. And we know that the Bible says if you break just one, you break the whole thing. And of course, we know back in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, you know, if you... If, talks about uh, killing your brother. If you hate somebody, if you're angry with somebody, talks about committing adultery, if you lust in your heart. I mean, that's, they thought that by obeying the law on the outside, they didn't have to worry about the stuff on the inside. So they were very meticulous. They were the fundamentalists. The Sadducees were the exact opposite. They were the liberals. The Sadducees were the ones that didn't believe in angels, didn't believe in the resurrection, didn't believe in anything supernatural. They were the, the pragmatic, the practical ones. They were the ones who uh, primarily the high priest were all, was always like a Sadducee because they were the ones who would be buddies with the Romans because it worked for them. You know, they got along with, with, with the, Roman, well, you know, the Roman governor because they figured, hey, you know, if we don't, he's going to be on our case, so we'll be buddies with him. And it didn't matter anyway because they didn't believe all that stuff about life after death. They were just, you know, they, they were the ones that just wanted to make things work. They were the liberals. Today, we have fundamentalists and liberals. Today, you got some guys that say you can't be saved. You know, a woman can't be saved if she wears pants. And then you got the liberals that want to, you know, ordain homosexuals. I mean, you got you got the, the both ends of the of the spectrum. It hasn't changed. Both of them missed Christ. Both of them missed Messiah. The final thing, and one that Matthew doesn't mention, but Mark does, is the government. Herod. He represents. The, 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 the governmental uh, authority. And they don't care anything about religion. You know, Herod was the one that had John the Baptist's head cut off because he didn't like what he was saying about it. We have the same thing today. We've got the fundamentalists. We've got the liberals. We've got the, you know, the, the oppressive government now that is, is trying to eliminate God from every vestige of our, our society. Same thing. Jesus had the same. He said, watch out for the doctrine, the leaven. Watch out for what they teach. I want to tell you something. It's important that the body of Christ watches out that they don't allow the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Herod to come into the church because it's coming in. You've got the super fundamentalist uh, control freaks. You've got the ones that just says, hey, anything goes, just you know, love, love, everybody's love. Then you've got the government trying to control everything. It's coming in. Jesus says, beware. Beware the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, okay? Now, verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, which is about as the, the most northern part of Israel that you could get at that time, he asked his disciples, and we preached on this before, and this is one of those passages starting at verse 13 to the end of the chapter. You would really do well to read over and over again and try to, 
commit, you know, if not to memory, at least in your mind. Jesus says, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? What a question. There are people who've gone out. I don't know if you've ever watched uh, Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron. They'll go out with a camera and a microphone, and they'll go talk to people about Jesus, you know. And they were, they were I was watching one of the programs. They were in, like, Denmark or somewhere over there. And if you think it's bad over here, man, that's, like, over there. And they were asking people about God and Jesus, and they were, I mean, some of the answers were just amazing. And if you ask some people around here, you know, with there's kids walking up and down the street, I mean, when I was a kid, everybody knew about Jesus. Some of these kids, you know, they might have heard the word as a swear word, but they don't know. And, and, and some, some people have the craziest ideas. I don't know where they get them. Uh, one time I was at a funeral. I wasn't doing the funeral. I was just there as a, you know, somebody who was there. And uh, the lady that passed away, her husband got up to give like a eulogy. And he said some of the craziest stuff I've ever heard about, you know, well, you know, we know you, should, you go to purgatory for 40 days and then you end up in heaven and then you end up going. And, and I'm thinking, about, where did he learn this? I mean, it's cr- crazy. I was, I was down to jail the other, you know, last, last time. And there was a guy sitting there. And he was uh, one of these guys that was always, like, throwing things in, you know, when you're talking. He was always, like, trying to help. You know what I mean? And uh, man, he said some stuff. He says, well, I forget exactly what it was. It was the craziest stuff I ever heard. I said, it ain't like that. I told him the way it was. He says, oh, oh. you know, they haven't heard. The doctrine of the Pharisees, the doctrine of the, of the Sadducees, it's confusing. Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? This is after almost three years of healing and preaching and doing all this stuff. Simon P, uh, uh, and they said, verse 14, some say that you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Almost like today. If you ask ten people who Jesus is, you're probably going to get ten different answers, unless you're talking to people who are in the church. And sometimes even then you'll get ten crazy answers too. But he said to them, well, what do you say about me? Here's his disciples. They've been with him for up three years, almost three years. If you go all the way back to John's gospel in the first chapter, Peter and James and John and Philip, they believed he was the Messiah from the very beginning. Because they, they confessed him. They said, this, uh, Philip went to tell his uh, a friend Nathaniel, he says, we have found him who is called the Messiah. But after almost three years of following Jesus and him not doing the things that they thought Messiah ought to do, even John the Baptist, when he was in prison, he says, are you the one we're waiting for? Now listen. He said, what do you say? And good old Simon Peter answered and said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. For once, Peter got a right answer. (laughs) Usually when he would say stuff, it was wrong. He said, Christ is the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. This revelation, this, this understanding you have of who I am, you didn't get it, you didn't learn it in school. He wasn't a school Pharisee. He didn't study the Torah. You know, he was just a Jewish kid that he studied it as a, as a young child because they would teach them in their homes. But... This revelation that that Jesus was the Christ, you know, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you didn't learn it, you received it. God gave it to you. Because you had an open, you had an ear to hear. All the the Pharisees and the scribes, they rejected it. They, They had the same evidence that Peter did. Now, says verse 18, and I say unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That rock, you know, I grew up in the church, they said the rock was Peter. If the rock isn't Peter, because we're going to find out in just a few verses just how much of a rock Peter was. The rock wasn't Peter. The rock is Jesus. 
The Bible said that the church, the, Christ is the cornerstone and the teaching of the apostles and prophets are the foundation, and we're built upon that. Jesus Christ is the foundation. He's the rock upon which the church or the ecclesia, the body of Christ. I believe this is the first time that that word church is used. Peter and, and, and the disciples, they didn't know he was talking about you know, the, the book of Acts and the giving of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. They, that word ecclesia, it means assembly. So they were thinking the assembly of Israel because they were Jews. They didn't understand anything else. He says, upon this rock I will build my church and praise God the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Death has no sway over the church. Satan has nothing. Jesus said in another place, the devil has nothing on me. The body of Christ will exist and survive and grow. I don't care what they do. I don't care what kind of laws they pass. I don't care what kind of persecution comes. The body of Christ will exist and grow even if we have to meet under the bridge. Because it's the, it's the church. You know, we, we, when we hear the word church, we think of a building or we think of a cathedral or whatever. That's not a church. That's just a building. We're the church. People. And there will always be people that are following Jesus Christ. There will always be a remnant. I don't care if they all go crazy. There will always be a remnant of believers. He says, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. We have authority coming from Christ. Even though the, 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 the millennial kingdom has not been established yet, we still have authority over serpents and scorpions and demons. Not in our own power. If we try to do it in our own power, we start thinking it's us, we're in big trouble. But Jesus Christ, he said, I'm sending you into all the world. Go into all the world. All power is given unto me, he said in the Great Commission at the end of Matthew. So the authority to loose and to bind, and people have played that thing up, you know, binding and loose. But it's, it's authority. It's authority. And it wasn't just given to Peter. You know, if you go over there in Rome, they, they believe that the Pope is the successor of Peter. They believe that Peter was the first Pope. You know? There's no evidence that Peter was ever even in Rome. Maybe he was. I don't know. But there's no evidence of it. When he wrote his letters, he said he was in Babylon. He was a whole, man, he was on the other side. But they made him, you know, so, so the Pope got the keys. You know, if you, if you look at the, at the symbol, they got two keys, uh, you know, supposedly. Those keys are for everyone in here that names the name of Jesus Christ. The authority to bind and loose and to pray. Now, if we could just convince ourselves and not, 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 not arrogantly, but if we could convince ourselves that through the power of Christ, we have authority over demons. I don't really particularly like to mess with demons. <laughs> but i got to believe that the, the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of me is more powerful than any spirit that dwells in anybody. He says, then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. See, he was coming to the end. It was, from this point on, he made his last trip to Jerusalem. And it's almost like he said, okay, I've showed them, I've told them, I've preached. Now, I don't want you telling anybody. We'll let, you know, when Jesus marched into the city, the people said, Hosanna. The children worshipped him. Okay, now, look at verse 21. All right. From that time forth, okay, here we are, Jesus, you know, miracles, King, Jesus the Christ, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. Man, they're ready. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem, and suffer many things of the elders, and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. How he must. Well, that's not 
That's not what they were, what they were bargaining for. That's not what they had planned. They were arguing about who was going to be greatest in the kingdom. They weren't thinking about him getting beat up. And it's interesting, you know, they, they stopped their ears. He was trying to explain to them what was going to happen. Had they listened to him, maybe when it did happen, you know what I believe? I believe only one of them listened to him. And this, this is my opinion, okay, so don't go around. This is my opinion. I think only one listened to him. You know who that was? John. You know why I believe he was the only one that listened to him? Because he was the only one that didn't run. That's right. He was the only one that didn't scatter. He was there at the cross with the women. He was the only one. All the rest of them, man, they were like rats on the sinking ship. They, they were gone. But John was there. I think John was listening. I think John was listening. That's my opinion, okay? Don't be firing me now. I'm just, this is my opinion. All right, now. He showed him all the things that he would suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Verse 22. You know, here goes old Peter, man. He, here, he is with, here he is with the answer again. Peter in his big mouth. I don't know if I ever preached that message. I wanted to one time. I don't know if I ever did. Peter in his big mouth. Peter took Jesus and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be. No, we're not going to let this happen. And Peter meant it. You know what? Peter told him another time. He said, I'll die for you. I'll, I'll go to prison for you. I got this sword. He meant every, he meant every, he meant every word of it. I believe Peter meant every, he would have died for him. Had, had, he, had he seen Jesus take up the sword and go against the Romans, Peter would have been right there with him. He meant every word of it. But when Peter saw Jesus say, put your sword away, that's when they took off. So you would think, I've, I've preached on this before, you've heard this, but you think Jesus would have said, hey, thanks, Peter. I appreciate your commitment to me. I appreciate you wanting to take care of me. I, I appreciate, Peter, man, you're, you're a good man, Peter. Thank you. Jesus didn't say that. Listen to what he said. Get thee behind me. What? See, he became an adversary. Now, now if that's the rock that the church is built on, man, we're in trouble. <laughs> So you know what was happening? He was practicing the, the doctrine of the Pharisees and the scribes and Herod. Just what that chapter started out with? Peter was eating it up. And he was, he was doing a good job of it. Because Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. You're an offense unto me. For you savor not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. The same thing that they were at the very beginning of this chapter, the same thing. They didn't want the things of God. Jesus was showing them and teaching them the things of God, and they didn't want it. They were trying to figure out how to kill him. Well, now here's Peter. Peter would never think about killing Jesus. But when Jesus was telling him God's plan, Peter said, oh, no. Jesus didn't pat him on the back. You see, when we, when we try to make God do what we think he ought to do, I don't care how holy you're living, I don't care how much you know the word, it's, it's the doctrine of the scribes and the Pharisees. When we refuse to submit to him and ask him to submit to us, I've been there, I've done that. You know, I want to do things my way. I have an idea how things ought to be done. And I found out when I, when I did things my way, I figured, I figured God would go along with my program. Well, I learned about that one. I can remember begging God for stuff. Oh, God, please give me a little bit. You know, and he did. And, and I would say, oh, God, why'd you do that? <laughs> okay. Now, now, now here, here it is. Here it is. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, here it is. Here's the doctrine of Christ. This is the exact opposite of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the scribes. Even though they have an external, they can look good externally, they can look religious and pious. Man, folks know how to look pious. Folks know how to look religious. 
I said, Lord, please never let me get to the place where I want people to think to, to, I want to look religious, you know. And we learn all the things to say. We learn the hallelujah, praise the Lord, glory to God. Hey, brother. We learn all the, all the things, all the external things that we do to make ourselves look like good Christians. But on the inside, Peter, Peter knew all that stuff. But on the inside, Jesus called him Satan. Man, I bet you Peter was all like, can you just imagine how broke he was? Jesus just got, just got done putting a star on his forehead, you know, for what he said before. Now he's calling him an adversary. Listen to what Jesus says. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, what's this? What are you talking about a cross? Jesus, you're the, you're the Messiah. What are you talking about a cross? For whosoever, here's the doctrine of Christ. It's completely opposite of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees and Herod. It's completely opposite of what half, 90% of the stuff we hear. Man, if I hear somebody talk about planting a seed again, I'm going to break my TV. I just go past it, you know, flicking through the channels. And I'll just stop every once in a while to see who's there. And I mean, they all say the same thing. They're all saying the same thing. It's like some, just, some say a little louder than the others, some a little more laid back. But they're all saying the same thing. Give us your money. Plant your seed. I'm so sick of hearing about seed. <laughs> For whosoever, look at verse 25, will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Here's the doctrine of Christ. It's not the doctrine of the Pharisees or the scribes. Because their doctrine was, you know, you know let me, I, I, want, I want to be promoted. I want more. I want to be able to get more. I want more power. I want to, I want to be looked upon as, I want to have a reputation. That's the doctrine of the scribes and Pharisees. They, they, they had a religious reputation. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? <laughs> The other night we, we were at the men's meeting and, and we were talking about over and uh, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, he said uh, that there are those that teach that gain is godliness from such turn away. For godliness with contentment is great gain. So it's not, and then he said this, he, he, one of those scriptures that we've all heard. He said, money is the root of all evil. He didn't say that. He didn't say money. Money's just a toll. Here's what he said. He said the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And I'll tell you what. There's some Christian folks that have learned to get money. They have learned how to get money out of your pocket. They'll say, I'll teach you how to get out of debt. Get your credit card and send a $1,000. <laughs> you know. You don't got to be a genius, all right? I mean, I, mean I, I never went to college anywhere, but I, okay. Here it is. For the Son of Man, oh, verse 26, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? If he had all the money in the world, if you're Bill Gates and you die lost, you're going to end up in hell. <laughs> Won't that be a shock? You can have it nice and easy. Man, live in a mansion. Better enjoy it now. That story, I'm going to talk about it Sunday night. That rich man and Lazarus, not Lazarus that was raised from the dead, but the beggar Lazarus. You know that story. Lazarus, rich man, he had everything and had big meals and all kinds of clothes. And, and Lazarus was laid at, the, at, the, at his door just asking for a couple crumbs. And he probably gave it to him. He probably helped him. They both died. The rich man was in torment. And see, here's the thing. He could, he could be wealthy and live to be 70, 80 years, 90 years. But eternity is forever. <laughs> okay, that's Sunday night. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then shall he reward every man according to his works. An important part of Scripture right here. 
It's not about what we are on the outside. It's not about putting on the, the religious suit. But it's about losing your life to his. So he's, Jesus is laying down the principles of the kingdom. He says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which will not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And as we go into the next chapter next week, I preached about it here a few months ago. I can't, we're going to do it again. What we call the transfiguration, when they saw Jesus in his original glory. The glory that he took off to come here and be born in a manger. They're going to get a glimpse of his glory. And the, and the thing is, you know, when Jesus, over there in John's Gospel, I believe it's chapter 12, He said, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had before. He wasn't talking about shining light. He was talking about the cross. He was talking about shedding his blood. We got it all wrong. Man, we got it all wrong in the body of Christ. It's not about how much you can give or get. It's about how much you're willing to die. And how much you're willing to let him live. Because he can only live in you proportionally to how much you're, you're willing to let yourself die. He must, I must decrease that he might increase. He's not going to increase as long as you decide you're going to keep yourself on the throne. He's not going to increase. And even with old Peter, man, it sounded good. Jesus, I'll never let them do that to you. Mm-mm. Father, help us die to ourselves. That we might live to you. Anybody have any questions or comments before... Uh, before we close tonight.